Hi, this is Ron Hicklin, voice of the Partridge family. Thanks for listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Nowhere in the world celebrates modernism better than Palm Springs, California. It's the home of Modernism Week, a week-long architecture and design festival that actually lasts 11 days. Again this year, U.S. Modernist Radio was there, speaking with nearly all of Modernism Week's keynote speakers plus special guests. Most of them joined us poolside at the U.S. Modernist Compound, the retro Hotel Skylark on North Palm Canyon Drive in Palm Springs. If you're in the mid-century modern, Modernism Week is the sine qua non of modernism. Good Latin. Oh, thank you. But for those of you who aren't fluent in Latin, that simply means it's the bee's knees, the hot ticket, the must-have event for modernist fans, a joyous festival of mid-century architecture, eye-popping house parties, brilliantly curated house tours, detailed art and architecture exhibits, and much more. I'm Tom Guild. All that awesomeness can be exhausting, which is why it's sometimes nice to just chill at the pool of the Hotel Skylark and stare out at the San Bernardino Mountains just across the street in a mile or two. We even bring in a professional masseuse for free massages out by the pool. It's a pretty sweet way to recharge for Modernism Week with U.S. Modernist. And sitting with me poolside at the Hotel Skylark, recording the very interviews you're about to hear, here's Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Thank you, Tom. It's a sad day today because this is the last set of interviews from the 2022 Very sad. version of Modernism Week. <laughs> it, I know, I know. I, I, where's the Kleenex? No, we're here. But we've got some great guests on today, which you'll hear from in a minute. And I just want to reflect back on the amazing work that the Modernism Week team puts together every year. It takes not just a village, it really takes a whole town You're talking about hundreds and hundreds of events and tours and lectures that take place during the 11 days of Modernism Week, and they do a stellar job of it each and every year. If you're into mid-century modernism like we are, Modernism Week is the Gulfstream, the Ferrari, the Callaway of architecture, all the things we love wrapped up into warm, sunny days and wonderful nights. If you'd like to go with me and Tom to Modernism Week in 2023 and stay with us at the U.S. Modernist Compound, email me at george at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs, and by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. In a timeless adventure that we are completely making up, realtor Angela Roll grew up in Estonia, the daughter of a former ambassador wrongly accused of spying on next-door Lithuania. He was cleared, it turns out, because Estonia only has six spies, and everybody pretty much knows who they are. After a night of partying with Le Corbusier's cousin, Boozy Corbusier, Angela took the ferry across the Gulf to Finland, causing an international incident involving a little red dress, a wood-turning lathe, the Finnish Coast Guard, and a $2,400 bar tab she accidentally signed over to Bjork. Uh Uh-oh. Angela escaped the resulting media frenzy on a train to Denmark in the company of international man of mystery, Eric of Arhos, whom she later married. Angela then moved to North Carolina to become a real estate agent. Specializing in modernist houses, Angela advises buyers and sellers on everything, from appropriate renovation to shipping a wood-turning lathe from Helsinki. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or call 919-995-0550. In this, the last show recorded at Modernism Week in Palm Springs, we've got some great guests. Aaron Batsky is a household name, if your house is full of architects. He's a critic, curator, educator, and lecturer who is director of the Virginia Tech School of Architecture and Design, a former dean of the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture and president of the Independent School of Architecture at Taliesin. Aaron has authored more than 20 books. Today, he's joined by returning podcast guest, photographer Andrew Pilich, an internationally published architecture and travel photographer. 
Like Star Trek, Andrew is on a five-year mission, maybe longer, maybe, (laughs) to photograph every single Frank Lloyd Wright building. Aaron and Andrew brought us the new book, 50 Lessons to Learn from Frank Lloyd Wright, a gorgeous compendium of photographs and thoughtful analysis, co-authored with Gideon Fink Shapiro from Wright's Trove of Writings. And now, here's our conversation with Aaron Betsky and Andrew Peelage in Palm Springs. So, Andrew, we've been following you over the years on your walkabout yes. to photograph all the right houses and buildings. I guess all the buildings, right? Correct. Every one of them. They're all on the In the list. United States. And you have a, a wonderful model for funding this is that you do photography classes. Yes. At most of the locations that you go to. So people can come and they can learn how to use their camera. And I assume camera has a broad definition these days. It's not just an SLR. It's an iPhone or anything, really, right? Yeah, that's true. The, the classes are uh, geared towards the DSLR or the mirrorless cameras. But I have no problems with using my iPhone, and I actually use it often to take photographs of right oh, and and An iPhone travels. is mirrorless. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it sure is. Well, you can yeah. get a mirror app. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> And people from the reviews are really crazy about your classes. Yeah, it's a it's a great experience. I mean, minus all the photography that, that's done and the, the instructions, we get access into these Frank Lloyd Wright properties that no one else can, especially yeah. with the camera. Some of these sites, we can bring our tripods in. Uh, it, it's just a new way of experiencing Wright for a photographer when they can come in there during the good light. You know, most of the photography done at these sites are done at the tours. Mm -hmm. So you usually have people, you're trying to lag behind to take photos. But here at the workshops, we get to slow down and really absorb the architecture and the light and the textures inside. And that's what really makes those workshops special. Now, I assume the good light is your late afternoon dusk period? Uh, the good light comes in the morning. Okay. Um, that's the blue light uh, right around sunrise, and we're usually there before the sun. Okay. Um, we don't chase light. We wait for it is what I tell the students. And then the second light is sunset. So it's that golden hour, which is never really an hour. It usually no, only lasts about 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. right. We have that at our house. We look out over the back, and we can see it sort of shifting around the trees. My wife will come in and say, look, it's on Golden Pond. And I'll say, I'll see it in a second. (laughs) And then a second goes by and it's gone. Absolutely. (laughs) Yep. 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 And that's why we try to get the photographers into position before that light is there, not when it's there already. Well, let's go back in time. It's 1959. And Frank Lloyd Wright, after a illustrious career, has passed away. And he has a wife at the time, and he has many students, and his practice and his school are, are really going, and the decades have shifted, and now we're many years away from that. Um, how does the legacy of Wright get interpreted now that practically no one's left that actually knew him? Aaron, I'll toss that question to you. <laughs> I think we now actually benefit from a certain amount of distance from the aura of Frank Lloyd Wright. He was, uh, shall we say, a strong personality. Yes. <laughs> um, and what's more, his third wife and widow, Ogavana, was also a very strong personality, and she turned the place uh, that he left behind, Taliesin, into a cult, a cult that was dedicated to the memory of Frank Lloyd Wright and to her particular interpretation of what that work meant. It was a tradition carried on by apprentices. They weren't students, they were apprentices and called themselves that, who in their work tried to carry on as they saw it, or from my perspective, tried to badly imitate uh, the work of Frank Lloyd Wright's last 10 years of life. Now we can look back and we can ask the question, what did he actually do? Now we have a certain amount of distance from Frank Lloyd Wright, and we can look at what he actually did. We can regard his buildings with a certain amount of distance, which is not to say without love, and we can understand what he was actually up to in terms of his desire to respond to landscape, to create communities, to find a way to open people's lives up to 
landscape and community through the use of space, through the way that he set the scene for everything from houses to churches to office buildings over a 60-year career, we can also see where maybe he didn't quite get it right and where the imposition of his forms was perhaps heavy-handed and also where some of them have not stood the test of time. I think that what's very important is to try and get away from the hero worship of Frank Lloyd Wright and to actually appreciate the beauty of what he did for what it is, not just because of his personality. You can go on YouTube if you want to see Frank Lloyd Wright's personality on his famous interview with Mike Wallace yep. oh. in the 50s and his appearance on What's My, What's Line, My Line, the game show. Yeah. He, he's very clear he is the best architect on the planet. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And he had this kind of air about him yeah. the whole time. And very regal, dressed very regally. You see him in all the pictures. You would not ever see him in T-shirt and jeans. He, you know, he have a around. Or yeah, something. he wore a cloak, cane, cane, right. yeah. walked by hat. He had yeah. the whole thing. The whole thing. And he famously said that you should take care of the luxuries of life and then the necessities will take care of themselves. <laughs> Which so, is a terrible financial strategy. Yeah, really. <laughs> it yeah, didn't work out well. <laughs> and, and when I first got to Spring Inn, Wisconsin, which is where Taliesin is located, I was meeting people and this elderly woman was introduced to me and she said, oh yes, Frank Lloyd Wright, that smelly old man who still <laughs> owes me money. <laughs> Wright was notorious for having these, these wild ups and downs in his career, both with the public's perception of him as a moral person, his commissions, his financial status, his his friends abandoning him and then coming back in you know great throng it was really quite a roller coaster of a life and career it's true and and one of the reasons why frank lloyd wright is who we think he is has the public stature he does is that at one of those points when he was downright broke he saved himself by writing his autobiography which is a very thick and very evocative book. It was a huge bestseller, and as far as I can tell, it is still the best-selling book on architecture ever by quite a distance. So Frank Lloyd Wright actively made his reputation, his career, his persona in the public, as you saw from him, using television uh, when it became a medium that he could avail himself of. He was a tireless self-promoter and a very good one. So part of what we see when we see Frank Lloyd Wright is, again, not just his beautiful buildings, but also the personality, what today is called starchitecture, mm -hmm. uh, people who are very good at promoting themselves. And I think that's evident with his front cover on Time magazine. It, it, it's not his structures or his design. It's a portrait of Wright himself, which, yeah. to your point, I think he was, a, he was an excellent promoter. Yeah. Before all the social media, he was doing it. Oh, sure. He was like his own Instagram, really. Absolutely. He was an influencer. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it seems like, you know, when you start your own school and you have your own compound... I mean, all you need next is automatic weapons and orgies, right? And you're, right. you're pretty much the full scale. And stakes. <laughs> uh, apparently they had the latter. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Yeah. Now, the whole generation of architects, including my dad, who was an architect, were influenced by Wright and the fact that these houses lived in such a different way than all the other housings, and, and buildings too, but we're focusing more on houses, that you would walk into one of these homes and, and you could feel the vibe instantly. It, it either captivated you or you would run, you know, screaming from the building in one or the other. And I don't know how to describe that, but I wanted to ask you what were some of the design elements that the average person might not know to notice that contributed to that vibe, Aaron? Um I think you're absolutely right, and one of the great 
advantages of the book that Andrew and Gideon Fink Shapiro and I did together is that Andrew's photographs really bring out that aura, those qualities very, very beautifully. In the book, uh, we actually try to define what we think are the, the tricks of the trade mm -hmm. or the points of emphasis around which Frank Lloyd Wright's work revolved quite literally. So one of the elements he loved using was a pinwheel. So the basic Frank Lloyd Wright house that he developed at the turn of the century of the last century in the Chicago suburbs was a central hearth which was the symbolic gathering point of the family and the core of the building, the house itself. And from there, the rooms would pinwheel out in an asymmetrical arrangement into the landscape so that you would move from this dense core of belonging, of being at home in every sense of the word, out to being part of the landscape, the community, and Frank Lloyd Drake felt both the larger urban agglomeration of Chicago and the democratic grid of the American prairies. And in fact, he did a project for House Beautiful in which he showed how that basic pinwheel organization could shape a whole community block after block after block in a way that you would be part of a nuclear family and then a group of four families and then a neighborhood and then an urban agglomeration. And he developed that even further in the 30s and 40s into what he called Broad Acre City, which was his vision of a democratic America where everyone would live with the same access to the landscape and where spaces would be open and welcoming to all. Now, having said that, it was the vision of a white male assuming that the core organization of any community was a nuclear family of a husband and wife and a few children. Right. But that vision was very much at the core of what he did. Over the years, he also developed a lot of other ways of making architecture that were particularly sensitive to the landscape. He believed, for instance, in building on the brow, not on the top of the hill. He believed in building with the land, not on it. So the work tries to be something that's not just putting a box on the landscape, like for all of the beauty of these modernist structures, so many of them here in Palm Springs are just objects stuck on a landscape that could be anywhere, and you just happen to look up and see the incredible mountains. Frank Lloyd Wright believed in nestling into the landscape, finding a way to make your buildings really fit into that landscape. Andrew, when you are going around to these houses and, and doing photography there, how much of it is including people? I mean, are, they, are people getting themselves in the shots, I know that a lot of architecture photography, there's no people. Is that changing at all? We did talk to a woman who has done a book of houses and dogs. Yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Modernist houses and dogs. So yeah. dogs, cats, people, what's going on lately? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know if the industry is really changing. I, I think that introducing that human scale to design and architecture has always been there. Mm -hmm. I think you're seeing a lot of the, the mainstream photography that's coming through. And I think I, I do enjoy seeing the scale when you introduce humans to it. it. It helps tell the story, especially when you're documenting a house that a family lives in. It's nice to see the whole family involved in the design and how they move through the space. But I, I would say that I think the human element has always been there in photography. You know, I just haven't seen a lot of it, in, yeah. to be honest. I mean, some of the Julia Schulman photos, right. you would see people posed. Yeah. yeah. But still there, I mean, right? Yeah. And even if you flip through Architecture Digest today uh, in the non-celebrity section where Jennifer Aniston is not pictured, yeah. um, <laughs> you won't see a lot of people. Huh. But... Publications like Dwell, for instance, put a lot of people into their photography. Yeah. So I guess it's shifting somewhat. 
yeah, and I think you're speaking to kind of the mainstream, yeah, right? You know, the the pretty photos that everybody wants is probably introducing that human element. Mm-hmm. But I mean, Stoller was doing it. He did it at Marin County Civic Center, but he was using cars to introduce that human element. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there is a new school of thought in which Iwan Ban is the most well-known uh, proponent that architectural photography should be a documentary of the life of the building rather than the building itself. And uh, Bonn is very, very good at showing buildings in use and as part of a social construct. As, and he's done a lot of work in third world countries, etc. I, I think Andrew is more interested in buildings, obviously if he's photographing Frank Lloyd Wright, Many of them are monuments or were designed for a purpose that's different than they have now. So he is documenting and preserving the structures rather than the active social life in them. And have any taken any peculiar turns, like has a house become an ice cream shop or something like that? I mean, what are you discovering out there? Uh, no, nothing, nothing too crazy. Um, you know, it's good to be back on the, the right trail, you know, with the pandemic and COVID and all, and all of that happening. So, no, it, it's interesting to talk with the owners of these, of these sites. And, and I think that's something that I've been exploring more now and trying to introduce new ways through this project of, okay, we're doing the photography and we're documenting that, but there's also this human element and stories behind the owners of these places. So, for instance, I uh, shot the the only house in Utah and was talking with the owner. You know, he was saying that it's been in the family for generations mm-hmm. and his parents bought it. They had to move away for work and had the opportunity to return to Utah and bought the house back because that's how, that's how much they loved wow. the design of Frank Lloyd Wright. And I think these are the stories that I'm trying to incorporate now into the project because I have this unique experience with these homeowners because I'm there for at least a day photographing. At least a day. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it's fun to start hearing these stories and not just spread the news about photography, but a little more in depth about the stories within the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. Well, have you been to Iowa yet? No. So uh, one of our friends just bought a Frank Lloyd Wright house yeah. in Iowa. Nice. So I'll be glad to make that introduction for you. I would love that. And uh, and she would very much welcome a visit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So there always are more to be found. Uh, find as in ones we don't know about that you haven't photographed. Oh yes, yes. So, yes, that's what yeah. I mean. He's. I mean, he designed over a thousand five hundred and thirty-two were built. I think there's four hundred and thirty-ish remaining. Mm-hmm. Um, I photographed now one hundred and six of them. So okay, uh, we're almost there, right around the corner. Only three hundred and twenty-five <laughs> right, yeah. so more to go. It's so. a life and life full <laughs> employment, thing. right? But it's. It's just as much about the the journey as it is the destination for me and exploring, right? And not only exploring it for myself, but sharing this project with others. So, oh, I I never knew he had a house in Utah. You know, Mm -hmm. it wasn't a tabernacle. It was a Mm -hmm. private home. So it's been an interesting experience. And I think this project will continue to evolve through the years. What's good? it, it, It does bring up this issue, which for me is problematic, not just with Frank Lloyd Wright, but with a lot of uh, modernist masterpieces, which is that they are preserved uh, with such reverence that they become dead monuments. I remember there's the famous house by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, the Tugendhat house in uh, Brno, Brno in the Czech Republic. And the first time we saw it, it had been fixed up once, but it was still pretty ruinous and messy. And they were going to restore it. And we thought, great. And then I went back after they restored it. And it is an absolutely incredible job. They spent 15 million euros restoring one house. And you put on your little booties and you can't touch anything. Mm -hmm. And the life in the house is just completely gone. And and just to put a little dig in, I'm afraid that's also what's happening at uh, Taliesin, Taliesin West, now that the foundation kicked out the school. And it's uh, it was one of the few sites that actually had an organic life to it. Yeah. With students working there and people living there, and now it's becoming uh, another dead monument. Well, anytime you get booties involved, you're in trouble. Yes. Right. Really. If they start putting plastic <laughs> on the furniture, then you know you're really yes. in trouble. Yes. Absolutely. 
The book is 50 Lessons to Learn from Frank Lloyd Wright, Andrew Pilage and Aaron Betsky. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. That was our conversation in Palm Springs with Aaron Betsky and Andrew Pilage. Returning guest, architect, and author Alan Hess has been on this show more times than anyone. If you're old enough to remember Johnny Carson, Alan is the Charles Nelson Riley of U.S. <laughs> Modernist Radio. Woohoo! A longtime advocate for modernist preservation, he is a prolific author with some 20 books. He is the architecture critic for the San Jose Mercury News, and he is currently researching the architecture of Irvine, California, one of the largest master plan communities in the U.S. He's the top presenter every year at Modernism Week. And this year, among other topics, he talked about the Mojave and Sonoran deserts and how that innovative architecture contributes to modern design trends elsewhere. Let's go poolside to my conversation with one of the greats, Alan Hess. Alan, you are now on the board of Modernism Week, but all along Modernism Week's existence, you have been a constant presence here, going from giving a lecture to giving a couple of lectures, to giving a bunch of lectures, to being really a local celebrity. I'm seeing Facebook posts now about people who are finding you are like, it's Alan Hess. (laughs) Yes. A couple of years ago, I was over by the um, art museum talking with a friend on the sidewalk, and suddenly this car drove by and honked its horn and said, Alan Hess. (laughs) You've made it, man. I have. I have. (laughs) That's the top of the preservation food chain. It is. It is. (laughs) When people in cars are calling out your name. Yeah. Well, you have also been very involved, too, in doing panel discussions for Modernism Week and, and other organizations, which is really fabulous. I mean, you've had an opportunity to talk with some excellent people and resources. What are some of the panels that you've worked with? Boy, being a moderator in a panel is really hard because you have to be like, like right there in the moment and playing off of you have to listen and then say something intelligent. So I used to be terrified of them. Now I'm a little more practiced in it. Actually, the panel that's on my mind right now is one that we just had at Modernism Week on black modernist architects in Southern California. Mm. Uh, Was this the one with the Crawfords? Right, right. And it was uh, called the Circle of Paul Williams. Architects who had worked, either worked with Paul Williams or had been inspired by him. They were the next generation. And this is such a field, you know, unfortunately, it's brand new. I mean, there's so much material that we don't know. So you don't quite know where a discussion is going to lead. Uh, there are great architectural issues. Certainly the people who worked with, we, we need to know about the people who worked with Paul Williams, who is such a, a great and distinctive and talented architect. But then how did that translate into a later period of the civil rights activism and so forth? Paul Williams, you know, he broke down the walls So the whole point of a panel is to draw out these personalities and their information, what they know. So you have to be listening really carefully, but you have to have background. You have to have studied and known enough so you can ask an intelligent question to get them to say something else interesting. I mean, you know, the the people who just say yes or no. Right. Or you're right. (laughs) <laughs> that is absolutely the, the worst panel. Um, yeah. You have to teach panels sometimes how to be panels. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was facilitating a, a group of architecture professionals on a Zoom call, and we went through the practice round, and they, a couple of them really needed to know how to respond, I mean, just even on a Zoom call. Yeah. yeah. Because you get people that either say one word or they turn on the fire hose and won't stop talking, right? Uh, yeah, you have to watch the time as well. It's really intense to be the moderator on a panel, but they can be very rewarding. And I mean, personally, like uh, this one, it was actually a, a filmed interview with Herb Green, mm. uh, the, the uh, organic architect 
studied with Bruce Goff and taught at the University of Oklahoma Architecture School. His most famous building is the Prairie House outside Bartlesville, Oklahoma, okay. which looks like either a wounded buffalo or a raptor bird, you know, pecking at the ground. I mean, it's an amazing piece of organic architecture. But, you know, he is of an older generation and did not really get the, the format that we needed to get him to talk. But fortunately, he liked my work and uh, appreciated what I knew. And so in our conversation, I was able to guide him into those places where he was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And again, this goes right back to the beginnings and the heart and you know the soul of what organic architecture was all about. So it was valuable, very valuable. This year, Modernism Week did their first premium tour of an organic house in Joshua Tree by Ken Kellogg, who is still with us. How is that house? It seemed pretty spectacular from the marketing materials I saw. It is. It was uh, built from uh, the early 90s uh, for you know, 10 or 12 years, but it embodies all of the aspects of organic modern American architecture, of doing away with convention, the past, using new technology to say, we can do a whole new structural system, we can redefine what a house is about, and what a living room is, and what a kitchen is, and what a bedroom is, and throw them all up in the air and come up with an entirely new and appropriately modern definition and form for those. So the, the house is, in my book, the textbook definition of organic architecture, uh, which I always say is, it's like a tree. A tree has roots, trunk, branches, leaves, flowers. Each one is entirely different in form and shape and color and purpose, and yet they all work together in an organic way, literally organic in the case of a tree. So this house, the whole redefinition of the space, the house is basically one continuous flowing space, but then there are areas which are naturally, you know, for sitting around the fireplace, a living room. Uh, there's a studio, an art studio is part of that. The master bedroom is on this kind of mushroom-shaped platform, mezzanine, overlooking the whole space. The structure, there are no walls. In fact, Ken Kellogg says, he says, you can make any material good except wallboard. Wallboard, he doesn't have much faith in at all. Right. So there's no wallboard here. But they're concrete columns, 26 of them all together, which each have their own foundation, and together they form, you know, they shape the space. As Frank Lloyd Wright said, what architecture is about is space, not the walls containing the space. So as a starting point, imagine you're watching the Flintstones. And there's a very rich man in town who has this fabulous place made out of all these different kinds of, it looks like almost uh, dinosaur bones is that reach over the whole thing. And that's your starting point in your imagination for what this house looks like. And then yeah. you can Google it. You can Google Kendrick Kellogg, Joshua Tree, and you'll see all the photos of this. And it really is one of the most unique houses in America. It is. It is. And the original owners were very private. They wanted their own world. The house is situated right on the edge of Joshua Tree National Park. And so it has a spectacular view, very Flintstonian. Yeah. I mean, these big round boulders are just everywhere. And this house absolutely fits in with, blends with. It isn't look like those. I mean, it's, it's you know, an interpretation of that. Yes. But it complements that natural setting. Now, what kind of car do they have? Do you get in and, like, run your feet really fast like Fred did to get down the mountain? <laughs> no, they have uh, electric golf courts. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so you don't have to wear out your feet. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. How did that tour go? It went very well. We had two tours, afternoon and then into the evening, 
And um, people were just overwhelmed by this house because they had probably all seen photographs of it, which, as you say, uh, you know, are really appealing, but has nothing to do, you know, with actually experiencing the three-dimensionality of real architecture. And as I said in my lecture, I talked about uh, Ken Kellogg this year at Modernism Week and his school of architecture, his concepts of architecture go back through Frank Lloyd Wright, back to Sullivan, and then even earlier to Frank Furness after the Civil War, blending technology with nature and not seeing them as separate, but bringing them together. Now, you might not know Kendrick Kellogg as an architect, but you may have eaten Kendrick Kellogg because he designed a lot of the chart house restaurants. Right. right. Which were more modern and very innovative in their time. Are those still around for the most part? Uh, apparently there is one in Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. And there's one in Dana Point, California. San Diego. I don't know if it's San I just don't know if the San Diego okay. one. A lot of them have been remodeled or closed or whatever. So they were originally 12 by Ken Kellogg. Okay. And these were very avant-garde for their time. They were kind of like the original Benihana's. A lot of celebrities would go to the chart house yeah. for dinner. And besides this experience of good food that you would be getting there, you would have this very innovative architecture, which for the most part, restaurants and modern architecture didn't quite mix. I mean, occasionally, but not so much. Yeah, there was one here in Rancho Mirage that people still talk about. They remember it. It was blue laminated beams curving and the whole room curved as well, right up against a hillside. So it was, again, part of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, it burned oh. mysteriously. Mysteriously burned. Mysteriously. Can you imagine that? A good piece of architecture <laughs> burning and uh, it never rebuilt. And the lot is still empty. It's a shame. Wow, that is too bad. Well, this was fine dining, right, at the chart house. If we go down a few levels, we get to the coffee shop level which you've been diving deep into a lot lately. You have a, a new book out called Googie Modern, Architectural Drawings of Armit Davis New Love. Arme Davis Arme, and New Love. Arme Davis New Love, which um, if you just look at the cover, it just grabs you right off. This is a drawing of a coffee shop, a rendering, and this whole era of innovative architecture and coffee shops swept across the nation, what, in the 40s? Starting in the 40s, but the 50s and 60s primarily, into the 70s. And, and these would, when you're going across the country, sometimes it'd be combined with these cool little I mean, mid-century modern motels. Mm -hmm. But it largely existed in California and Florida and states like that. What was the allure of these coffee shops? Well, it wasn't just that through chains like Bob's Big Boy and Denny's, okay. Okay. they spread all across the country. And they were the designs of Arme and Davis, which is the original firm's name. Okay. Uh, so these could be found actually in Canada, U.S., oh, really? and okay. Mexico. Okay. Yeah. And this is modern architecture. But functionally, they're for the average person, you know, going in to get a piece of pie, a hamburger, whatever. And so they are... I, I believe the primary way in which modern architecture was experienced by the mass audience. Not everybody can afford to live in, you know, Richard Neutra's Kaufman house right. or something. For right. Sakes. A couple of these were very famous. Mel's, for example. Norm's in L.A. I got to eat last fall in Norm's for the first time. Good. So what's it like driving up to one of these places? Well, again, form follows function, and the function of a restaurant is to bring people in. And so from the road, you see, first of all, a, a great sign, which is integrated, complementary to the architecture. They usually had a very prominent roof, which was exaggerated because it needed to be the scale that the restaurant could be seen in, you know, the power lines and other businesses and signs of the commercial strip. And then it had a wraparound glass walls as well because you wanted the person driving by to see in and see it's a popular place, see the color, see the modernity, see the you know natural materials 
because this is organic architecture also, right. uh, inside. And then when you're inside, you're sitting basically outside. I mean, you're enclosed by glass and you're air conditioned, but you're, it's like you're dining in an outside garden, terrace, which is California living, of course. So all of those things went into the design of the architecture. This book is a collection of the original renderings by Army and Davis, who were the primary Googie architects. Some of these were client presentation drawings that were three feet by four feet long, hand-drawn pencil. They're just absolutely the greatest examples of mid-century graphics and uh, as well as architectural design. Well, it's a miracle that, that they survived because most stuff like this gets thrown away, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. Well, how did it live? Who thought to save it? Well, the firm is still in business, and it was the third surviving partner, Victor Newlove, who is still, still working, and he understood the value of these drawings. So originally they saved these because they would go back and remodel these buildings over time. The clients came back and said, you know, I, I want that again or whatever. So it was purely a business decision to save these archives. But now we also see that they have a historical and architectural value. And some of these were dine-in places. Of course, Bob's Big Boy, had you could pull up in your car and order through the little intercom there by the menu, right? Right. And then in recent years, and by recent I mean since the 80s, the only new one of these I could think of, and I wanted to ask you if you knew more, would be like Sonic. Sonic has come along in the last few years with this very modern look and outdoor ordering, indoor ordering too. Are there other ones kind of on the horizon that are bringing this back that you're aware of? Yeah, there is a chain down in the Texas area, and the name escapes me right now, but they it's a small chain, but they have adopted mm -hmm. the Googie style okay, as well as the drive-in service. You know, when I came out here and, and had my first In-N-Out burger, which is delicious, by the way, um, I expected it to be more Googie than it was. You know, in terms of the of the building and what was inside, it was it reminded me more like of a 1960s McDonald's, yeah, in in style. Yes, they were very simple buildings originally, and they have kept them simple as well. The original family still runs that chain. Oh, really? Yeah, but uh, then also Chick Fil A, which of course is now all over the country, recently decided to restore an original. Googie restaurant in Los Angeles on Van Nuys Boulevard. And it's pictured in my book. It was originally called Stanley Burke's from 19... 19... I believe it's on page 152. Am I correct? You are correct. <laughs> Thank you very much. And it was from 1958 by Armin Davis. And I have to mention the interiors of most of these restaurants were by Helen Fong. Okay. who was a longtime associate of Armin Davis. And she created these marvelous in modern interiors. And it, the building had been remodeled over the years in various ways, but Chick-fil-A, in their corporate wisdom, decided to invest in restoring the original building. We're going to add a, um, a drive-through, because that's yeah. part of their business, for today, but it will not affect the original architectural interiors and exteriors as well. Good design, you know, you can add, you can adapt, you can change, you can make a new use, but you can keep the original character. It'll remain on the streets of Los Angeles. So adaptive reuse is really something I'm, I promote whenever I can, especially for these sorts of buildings. Well, you know, I have to give a shout out to Chick-fil-A because during the pandemic, my wife and I were astonished at our local Chick-fil-A which, you know, because you couldn't eat inside, had a double drive through had set up tents over the drive through temporarily, taken most of their staff outside, rain, shine, whatever, and they were shooting through hundreds of cars. I mean, you would get in line with 20 cars, and maybe it would be six minutes, seven minutes, before you'd be driving away with your chicken sandwich? Yeah. It was just unbelievably well-organized. Yeah. 
And I, gosh, if they're applying that to doing this building, I can't wait to see what is going to be happening. Yeah, we are just about to start. On, I'm the historic consultant on the restoration project. And we're just do get, about. Do you get free chicken sandwiches, Alan? No. <laughs> If anybody is, is listening, is that not in your contract? It's not in my contract. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great perk. That yeah. would be for life. McGee yeah, suggests that. Right. Yeah. And then when your fans see you in the street, you can just hurl them a chicken sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But the other thing about this is it's on Van Nuys Boulevard, which mm-hmm. was one of the major cruising strips. Oh, of course. Of yeah. Southern California, and so this continues that modern life of the automobile, the car culture, mm-hmm. but updated for today so it can stay viable. So a question I've, I've been wanting to ask you, actually I wanted to ask you last time you were on the show, but I forgot, is that in this era of, of global warming and changes in energy and world conflict going on, how much is being invested in these modernist buildings in terms of sustainability and specifically around like putting solar panels on the roof or having batteries that, you know, power the restaurant or things like that. Yeah. Well, uh, again, another example of restoring a Googie building in Whittier, California. There was a Googie car wash there since the early 60s. And it's one of these classic Googie car washes in Los Angeles with these steel pylons with yeah, big spikes sort of things exactly that come up. Yeah. yeah and it's all open air so you know you can see as you drive by you see the cars going through and being washed by all the, this equipment well the thing is that this old one has been restored using new equipment which saves water and uses chemicals cleaning chemicals which are you know friendly yeah. to the environment. And I think it's a great idea because the idea of the original Googie and modern architecture was using technology to make a better life for the average person. Mm -hmm. And in this car wash, in fact, they renamed it the Googie car wash in Whittier. Really? Yeah. Is your picture on the wall? Because I think your picture should be on the wall if they're calling it Googie. No, (laughs) this is another great idea, George. You should have suggested to them. But it takes that idea, that faith in technology, and updates it for the great concerns of, you know, water usage in California and sustainability and so forth. It's completely possible. We don't have to tear down older buildings in order to build more sustainable buildings, which are brand new. In fact, that's a very complicated calculation it takes years for a brand new building to really earn back its uh, carbon footprint, basically. Right. But if you have an existing building and adapt it, you're keeping all that embodied energy, whether it's a concrete, a brutalist building, or a steel googie building, or whatever. But we need to get across that idea that you can't just tear down buildings and think you're doing something green for the environment. Well, I've been learning while I was out here. I had a conversation with Jeannie Gang about concrete. Exactly. She's getting ready to redo the Chicago airport, one of the giant terminals. And concrete is one of the biggest contributors to global warming. But evidently, and this is not rocket science or anything, they've figured out different ways to make the concrete. So they can take out about 98% of the adverse effect on the environment when they're making the concrete. Right. So... You multiply that by the number of hundreds of thousands of cubic yards you need to make a terminal and taxiways and adjacent stuff like that. That's a lot of positive impact on the environment. Yeah, and that's what we need to get across. And here at Modernism Week, this is, you know, kind of one thing we follow through with, which is that it's wonderful to save these buildings. They're beautiful. People enjoy seeing them. But that's not the entirety of their value to us. And through these adaptive reuses, remodelings, et cetera, these older buildings can, should be and can be made a part of the future. We need to get that message across to planners, to cities, to developers, et cetera. Well, last spring, it was in the news around the country about a Marcel Breuer house called the Geller in La Lawrence, New York, 
that the couple that owned it told everybody that they were going to save it and restore it, and then a couple days later, boom, it was gone. Here in uh, the Palm Springs area, the name Maslon gives people nightmares because of the same situation about 15 years ago. Are there other houses on your radar that we should be worried about or try to be intervening in early to keep that kind of thing from happening? Okay, you've touched a real sore point for me, George, because Los Angeles, just talking about Los Angeles, has and so many really great historic buildings by great designers, but we have no organized way to assure that they are going to be existing in 5, 10, 20 years. Yeah. Um, and these are artistic treasures. You know, we, we put our Picassos and our Rembrandts into museums under air-controlled situations right. to save them for later generations to learn from. But buildings we just leave to the whim of the marketplace. Recently, Richard Neutra's Lovell Health House, of course, was sold. Yes. And it seems to be in good hands now. But it could just as easily have been sold to somebody who says that's an old building, let's knock it down and build a mega mansion. Sure, and they were approached by people who would have done that. Exactly, exactly. No, we need some sort of way. The cultural community, the architectural community of Southern California need to come up with a better way to handle these treasures. Speaking of diplomatic relations, how are things between the preservation community and the real estate community? Because I know in a lot of cities, they don't really talk to each other. You know, the preservationists are, don't want the real estate people to be making money, and the real estate people don't want the preservationists being annoying and getting in their way. Uh, we found in North Carolina that by forming that partnership, the real estate agents have been our best early warning system to find out about the intentions of the houses, sometimes months or years, before they become a problem. Because as you and I know, you just can't win these 11th hour bulldozer at the door kind of battles. Right. So how is it in Southern California with the preservationists and the real estate agents? Well, both in Los Angeles and I live in Orange County, and Orange County is often seen as kind of a very conservative area. But we definitely have uh, real estate agents who specialize in modern housing tracks and modern houses and who appreciate them and advertise them as such uh, when they're doing their, uh, their real estate sales as well. I, it's a question. I don't know what percentage of the real estate uh, industry that covers, but we need to expand. Uh, we need to have conferences, talks, et cetera, with all sorts of real estate agents to show them that just you know, coming in and, oh, you can, you can rip out that kitchen. Oh, you can redo that facade you know, if you don't like the mid-century look. We need to educate people. I mentioned earlier about uh, this panel on black modernist architects. One of the people we talked about, now past, is Roy Seeley. And he designed a really great modern, even googie hotel in Long Beach called the Marina Seaport Hotel in the early 60s. Great piece of architecture. But I don't know, about 10 years ago, uh, it was torn down. And one quote in the newspaper from somebody who wanted it to be demolished, said, well, it's not Paul Williams, so we don't have to be concerned about saving it. Right. Well, that's because he had absolutely no idea who Roy Seeley was, what his work was, how important he was, and that the building was a good example of historic architecture. So that's just, you know, due to ignorance and, you know, how do you solve ignorance? Education. So there's a lot more we need to do in terms of educating people about the style, the architects, the historical culture that it represents, and so forth. Well, in most jurisdictions, is it still true that if you go downtown to your local city office and file for a demolition permit, it's instantaneous, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of it's uh, online these days. Just click, 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 and you're done. It can be. There are cases, though, where in 1934 there was a flood in the basement of the city hall and they lost a lot of records. Right. But, no, it's much easier today to find out that information. And historical designation 
doesn't stop demolition typically, but can slow it down for various amounts of time. Sometimes it's a month or six months or a year. What are some of the cities that have instituted those kind of policies you're aware of where designation will slow down a demolition permit? Well, Los Angeles has a cultural heritage commission and they rely on, you know, solid facts, historical research. Uh, They review all of that. They have a staff that makes sure that it's solid history and uh, then they can designate a historic cultural monument. Okay. And then those protections, which are, again, mostly postponements. Yeah. So that another use can be found, another owner, whatever, or just convincing the owner that there's a value. I was involved with one of those. It was actually L.A. County in 1993 for the Bob's Big Boy on Riverside Drive in Burbank. Okay. And when we proposed it as a uh, county landmark, it was originally opposed by the owner who wanted to tear it down for a high-rise office. But we we did win. Again, this this was kind of a miracle. And then the owner began to learn about the value of the restaurant Mm -hmm. and turned it around, did a little bit of spiffing up, and it became the most uh, profitable restaurant in the Bob's Big Boy chain at that time. And it's still going gangbusters. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people realize that Bob's Big Boy is still going. Yeah. There are a number of locations around the country. Yeah. Of course, you know, that statue is is so iconic of the, you know, the little boy holding up the burger. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Getting back to protections, how much is being done to educate people about preservation easements? Because, again, in most jurisdictions, that's the only thing that actually legally protects a house. You know, you can give it awards, you can put it on the National Register, you can have the city put a little plaque on your front door, but that really doesn't protect it over time from being destroyed, like a preservation easement does. Right, right. An easement kind of defines a part of the building, you know, facades, interiors, whatever is important about it. And then it gives kind of a review of it to usually a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. And then they hold the easement and are supposed to, you know, check in, make sure that, you know, whatever parts of that easement. Because it are rides identified. with the deed and that's why it becomes legally enforceable. Right. And I know of a case uh, in Orange County of a William Cody house in Orange County. William Cody, of course, is known out here in Palm Springs, but he built houses elsewhere. And the original owner, you know, just loves the house, appreciates the house. It's a great house. And so wants that to continue. So she is considering an easement as one possibility for making sure that the house doesn't fall to the whims of the real estate market. And, you know, what's important about these easements is they're like the volume knob on your stereo. They can be as low or as high as you want. Exactly. Um, What most people end up doing is regulating how the house looks from the outside and saying that if a future owner wants to add on to it, it has to be added on in the same style, compatible with how the original looks, so you're not just glomming some kind of yurt onto the side of your Cape Cod, onto the side of your modernist house. And you can also ramp it up a little bit if you want it to apply to the inside. But uh, most of the preservation easements, at least in our area, are about the exteriors and allow people to make the inside changes, you know, however they see fit to modernize their kitchens and their bathrooms and so forth. Yeah. Because on a practical matter, most people who are going to buy a house with a preservation easement on it are already kind of into it anyway. So they're not, they're not going to come in and do something really ridiculous to the inside of one of these houses. But we're always trying to encourage preservation organizations to talk these up because that, that's real protection. You can take that to court. Yeah, yeah. And, and people do get taken to court sometimes because they don't follow those rules. Yeah, yeah. You had the case up in San Francisco of a Richard Neutra house that was, again, just demolished, the one the Maslin house here. Uh, so there is this attitude, you know, it's deeply embedded uh, in American psyche of, you know, it's my property, I will do whatever I want with it, tear it down or remodel it. But that's only partially true. 
because the whole idea of a city or a neighborhood is that it goes together. It's many pieces which create a synergy in the best neighborhoods, which are, you know, beautiful, comfortable, supporting social life, making a healthy community. So you have to realize, yes, you own your piece of property, but it is part of a larger civilization. And so you always need to be balancing all of these interests. You mean I can't park my snowmobile in my front yard? No. Oh, okay. No, sorry. <laughs> the book is Googie Modern, Architectural Drawings of Armé Davis' New Love. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, George. Always great to be with you. That was Alan Hess chatting with George Smart at Modernism Week. Our returning guest, fashion designer and CEO Trina Turk, is responsible for one of the most exciting brands of brightly colorful, wildly fun clothing for both men and women. George shopped there this year and got a jacket so bright you can see it from space. (laughs) Trina is also a serial modernist, having owned a J.R. Davidson in L.A.'s Silver Lake, the ship of the desert. A 1936 streamlined modern house in Palm Springs, designed by Earl Webster and Adrian Wilson, a long-lost John Lautner in L.A.'s Echo Park, and a house by Joseph Escherich at Sea Ranch in Northern California. Trina is an active philanthropist, contributing to arts, education, and preservation causes, including the U.S. Modernist Advisory Board. Last February, she spoke at Modernism Week to discuss the influence of another lifestyle entrepreneur and tastemaker, Vera Neumann. Here's George with Trina Turk as we close out another amazing year of poolside conversations at Modernism Week. So Trina, thank you for coming back on the show. When we first talked to you a couple of years ago, your, your lovely husband had passed away and you were looking at your life and you were very like, yes, 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 let's grab it. And then the next year it was, oh no, no. And now you've kind of hit a balance point for yourself. Yes, I think I went overboard on the yes. <laughs> Uh, but then I guess in a way COVID was a, a, a no <laughs> that was imposed <laughs> by the world <laughs> or by the universe. So, um, yeah, now I'm somewhere in between. And thank you for having me. You had a party recently at your house, the Ship of the Desert. How was that? Yes, it was a lot of fun. It was to celebrate Vera of the famous Vera Newman scarves and housewares. Uh, the woman who purchased the collection of her original artwork, um, her name is Susan Side. She was in town for a panel discussion that we did. So the party was a follow-up to the panel discussion. For those of you who are not familiar with Vera, she was this very prolific artist and entrepreneur. I think she's most famous for her scarves, but she also did apparel and homewares, so- mostly soft goods, sheets, towels, napkins, placemats, all with these beautiful designs that were her own paintings. And I believe her company started in the 40s and it reached this peak in the late 60s and early 70s, which is kind of a very inspirational era for me. Yes. And so um, I've been a fan and a collector for a long time. Now, for the MBAs in our audience, Vera was also one of the originators of cross-licensing. Yes, she was. How did that work? Well, I mean, basically, she expanded into multiple product categories, often working with manufacturers who were expert in the particular category, and then they used her name on the products and paid her a royalty. This is like Michael Graves and the teapots from years ago? Yes, it is like Michael Graves and the teapots. Or, you know, in the case of my company... For example, our swimwear is a license where we work with an expert swimwear manufacturer on the design and the prints and the colors and the styles, but they're the ones who do the actual manufacturing because they have the expertise in making swimwear, which is is a very specific type of manufacturing. Yeah, you just can't go in the water in anything. No, (laughs) you cannot. And she was really quite successful with this cross-licensing. She was was wildly successful. I mean, her company was a $100 million company in, I believe, the late 60s. That's huge. I don't know what that translates to in today's dollars, but in my neighborhood, 
in San Jose, California, and Bellevue, Washington, it was pretty ubiquitous. Lots of people had it in their homes, and I think that her paintings are beautiful and very well done, but there was a kind of casual and effortless quality that I think appealed to homemakers of that era. And it was optimistic and bright and colorful. I mean, her use of color is pretty amazing. And, you know, my mom, it appealed to my mom. She bought a lot of it. We had the sheets, the placemats, the towels. You know, we had a lot of it. And I don't think it was just a West Coast thing. She was in all the major department stores across the country. And her business was wildly successful. Her name is spelled N-E-U-M-A-N-N. Yes. So you can be Googling this while we talk. Did she ever achieve one name status like Cher? People would refer to her work as Vera? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there are avid collectors, apparently many in Palm Springs, because people were very excited about the presentation. And, I mean, I collect it myself, but I think that there are a lot of people who are much more obsessed than I am. And I would imagine that on eBay today, the prices probably went up a little bit because <laughs> there were 400 people at that presentation yesterday. Is this like a, a Disney convention when they're getting all the pin people <laughs> together to talk about the rare pins? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I've never been to one of those, but possibly. Now, where did you have the talk? Uh, it was at the Annenberg Theater at the Palm Springs Art Museum, Okay, which, which is, is a, bright you, orange. Beautiful site, right? <laughs> which, yeah, the interior is bright orange, which was perfect for the Vera talk. 400 people is a lot of people to show up for a yeah, lecture. Yeah, orange was her favorite color, too. What were some of the more popular items of hers that, that women found particularly attractive? I would say the scarves. And she went beyond just selling scarves with really interesting marketing, beautifully done marketing, where she explained many ways to wear a scarf. She talked a lot about her inspiration. She traveled a lot. For example, she went to the Middle East and she did a Persian garden collection. She went to India. She did a Vera Paints Blaze of India collection. So these collections were named and they used the tagline Vera Paints, which was a way of really connecting the fact that she was the artist to the product. She encouraged framing of scarves and... What, what is that, framing of scarves? She encouraged framing the scarves as if they were a piece of artwork and hanging like them on the wall. Like behind glass? Yes. Oh, okay. And because she felt that, you know, she wanted to sort of democratize the idea of art, of her paintings, and she thought that everybody should be able to have beautiful things on their walls, not just the elite or the wealthy or whatever. So... This idea of framing the scarves was something that she encouraged. So when I say that she took it beyond just like, you know, the marketing went beyond a picture of a scarf, you know, she showed you how to wear it. She talked about where she had traveled to be inspired to do this painting. With the napkins, you know, she showed you 10 ways to fold a napkin. So it was really, the marketing was very, very clever and obviously resonated because the company was so successful. And, and where did she advertise primarily? Uh, she advertised in fashion magazines. Okay. So Vogue or Harper's Bazaar and possibly women's magazines. But I think that her price points were affordable, but I think her advertising was sophisticated and a little mm -hmm. bit elevated, mm -hmm. uh, which maybe, you know, drove the desire for the products because they seemed, you know, worldly and sophisticated, but they were affordable. Well, I dug back into my family archives and found that my mom was one of her fans, too. <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, I think that everyone around our age probably had it in their homes at some point, some, yeah. some product in their homes, because it was, I'm, on the West Coast, it was pretty ubiquitous. Yeah, these brands that were popular... 68, 70, 72, in that range. I mean, my mom was all into Ferragamo. Yes. And we had the one store in town that would sell Ferragamo, and she would go over there like it was the, the what's the building in Rome where the Pope lives? The Vatican. Uh, <laughs> how did I lose that? And she would go over to that store like it was the Vatican. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there were probably collectors of the scarves in the day. And now I know five or six people who collect Vera. And I sort of think I'm a, you know... A mid-range yeah, collector, Yeah, a mid-range right? collector. Well, there's always somebody crazier than you, I've discovered. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you don't want to be the craziest person <laughs> in whatever niche that you're in. Right. There was actually, also on the panel, was the curator of an exhibition that was at the Museum of Art and Design in New York in 2019 of Vera, she had a much more kind of academic approach to what Vera was doing. And uh, there was also a gallery owner, Alexander Gray, who is an avid collector. I would say he's several notches above my level of collecting. And he somehow met Susan Side, who owned the archive of the original paintings and did a couple of shows in his gallery which was sort of elevating her paintings to the level of fine art. Of fine art, of sure, which is, I'm which sure. Which they what are. Would, yes. You know, they are at if that they're level. they're getting framed, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyhow, it was a varied panel, and it was very interesting. I think it's going to be available to stream. Oh, nice. I know there was a live stream, and I believe that the museum and Modernism Week are going to figure out how to have it available. What happened to Vera's organization and company? Did it get sold to a bigger company? Was it taken by heirs? What happened there? Uh, what happened was her beloved husband died, and she continued on for a while and then eventually sold her company to the big apparel company. and Multiple brands underneath yes. their umbrella. Then the company that purchased Vera was purchased in a hostile takeover by another company that was really focused more on menswear. Mm -hmm. And so the Vera brand sort of fell by the wayside and they weren't really focused on it. The archive ended up belonging to a company in Atlanta. I mean, there was, there was quite a chain of it changed hands many times after Vera herself sold it. And Susan Side, who owns the archive now, was working for the company and just became aware that they owned it and actually figured out how to finance a purchase of this archive because she was so passionate about it. And the company who owned it wasn't really that interested in it. Yeah. and didn't really understand what they had in terms of springboard for creating products. I guess if you're a menswear company, you're just not going to be focusing on this no. beautiful work by Vera. No. So that's what happened. I mean, it, I, there were many steps along the way, but eventually Susan en ended up buying this archive. Does the archive have plans to relaunch any of this for the future? Well, what I believe what has happened is that she because has... Because I know one store that might want to sell it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she now solely owns the archive and has sold the rights to manufacture products under the Vera name to another company. Okay. So she retained the archive just because she loves it and it was her passion project. But do you know if anything's coming available through that party? Well, there's a small collection that was done for Modernism Week by a store in downtown Palm Springs called Destination PSP. PSP, right. They worked with the company that owns the rights for manufacturing, and they did a small capsule collection that has some towels, some tote bags. I mean, we have it in our store. Mm -hmm. um, they're the main distribution point, but because there was a lot of Vera activities going on. We also bought some for our store. And it looks good. I mean, it's all print. So how has it been for you as an owner of multiple stores around the country getting through COVID? Well, it was challenging and interesting. We ended up closing six out of 12 stores during COVID. But weirdly, it kind of gave us an opportunity to clean house. Mm -hmm. And of course, we closed the underperforming stores. Yeah. And then really took the money that we were spending on stores and 
put it all into e-commerce. And actually, our business is quite healthy. I mean, 2021 ended up being a really great year. It was also a coincidence that we had hired a new marketing and e-commerce director. I guess it was the fall of 2019, so Mm -hmm. before the pandemic happened. So we were starting to put things into place to really focus on e-commerce. And then when that happened, we really focused on e-commerce. And last year ended up being not bad. So although we closed six out of 12 stores, we actually did better in 2021. Well, I mean, you kind of can't even count 2020. Yeah, you have to just write um, that off, Yeah, right? yeah. You just have to write that off. True. But yeah, business is really healthy. Um, last year in our, our Palm Springs stores, our, our number one brick and mortar store, and it really kicked off mid-February last year is when we saw a real pickup in Palm Springs. And I, even though it was still COVID and there were still mask mandates, Palm Springs, you know, is located within a two hour drive of a huge population. Right. And so I think that people were able to come here without getting on a plane. And it was just a change of scenery for all of us who'd been, you know, at home. <laughs> Looking at looking at yeah. our same four walls. Right. Watching uh, Netflix. Yeah. 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 And so last year was great in Palm Springs. And from all we can tell now, the 2022 will also be a good year. So what are the six stores that are still around? The six stores that are still around are Palm Springs, Palm Desert, Dallas. That's in Texas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why am I blanking? Atlanta. That's, that's in, in Georgia. Georgia. Burlingame, California. California, uh uh-huh. And um, I actually said six, but you know what? We closed six last year, and we just recently closed our store in Honolulu. So we only have five. Okay. Yeah, we have five now. I forgot about Honolulu. Newsflash, yeah. Yes. (laughs) Just five stores. Yeah. I have been a recent customer of yours. I saw you wearing that flashy jacket. In your store. Uh, I bought a jacket from the Mr. Turk collection, and I saw this jacket, which sort of leapt off the display case to me. It's not for the faint of heart. (laughs) Yes, yes. You can't wear it in certain places. Uh, You wouldn't want to go into a bar in Waco, Texas, wearing (laughs) this jacket. But any resort destination would be fine. And what was really fun is um, the staff there, of course, was great. And this was two days before I wanted to wear it. The sleeves were too long. So I asked if the store did any alterations, and they said no. But there's this place down the street called Edgar and Elvira. And if you call them, they'll help you. So I call down there, and Edgar answers the phone. And he says he'll be able to fix my sleeves in like 36 hours. And so we rush down there in an Uber because he's about to close, right? It all worked out. The night that I wear this jacket to an event, we went out afterwards to the street fair that they have here. And people were coming up to me in the street asking for photos (laughs) with the jacket. Certainly it wasn't me. I was just the (laughs) steward of the jacket. It could have been been both. (laughs) I'm super happy now. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) It's like this uh, magic technicolor dream coat. (laughs) That I can wear. So thank you for that. (laughs) You looked great in that jacket. (laughs) As Palm Springs moves towards the future with modernism week and other things, and as COVID hopefully dies off, what are some of your plans for your house and your chain of stores? And are are you looking to expand again? Are you going to focus more on the e-commerce side? I mean, have you got anything in the works? Um, We are definitely interested in stores in the right locations. I mean, right now, we, like many companies, are using our e-commerce data to find out where we're shipping the most orders Mm -hmm. and then thinking about doing probably pop-ups to start with. I don't think that we are ready for signing those long-term leases like we used to do, unless we're pretty sure about it. But the landlords, I think that they're becoming less flexible, but there was a moment when they were quite flexible with pop-ups. We'll see what happens going forward. And I guess the other thing as far as brick and mortar retail goes, we're really interested in just trying to make it more of an experience 
for example, at this past Modernism Week, we had an exhibit, an uh, art installation, essentially, in our main corner window of a Pittsburgh artist, female artist named Aronel DeRoy Gruber, okay. who did these really amazing sort of vacuum-formed plastic sculptures and jewelry. And it's very bright colors, sort of pop art in feel. It looked great in our corner window, and so we really want to do more of that just so that it's a different experience than just a regular clothing store. I mean, I think in Palm Springs it's already a different experience because we have lots of different little mini departments in our store, and um, our store is a bit of a destination in Palm Springs. But I do think that adding in this other element of installations or artwork will be something that we're going to be working on going forward. Now, those of you listeners who are also on our newsletter list at U.S. Modernist know that Trina has been bravely fighting against the Marilyn Monroe statue, which has been erected here in Palm Springs, with her dress flying up and her butt facing the Palm Springs Art Museum. Not the greatest of sights to be seeing as you exit the art museum. To make a a long story short, um, the city and various people have sort of gotten away with this by declaring the street which they have closed as, quote, temporary, right? Yes. Which looks pretty permanent to me. Yes. So my question to you, Trina, is, okay, if that's what temporary is, can you just pick a really interesting pop-up place and call it temporary and put a store there for a while? Like, could you be in some iconic house for six months or some other kind of really interesting location to have your work, and it's temporary. I suppose that's possible. I mean, I think that the the, the Palm Springs City Council <laughs> sort of uh, abused the meaning of the word temporary yeah. with their supposedly three-year road closure. But yeah, I mean, I think that's true. Like, that's kind of what we're talking about is just doing something that's not your usual store. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it's in an architectural location, of course, all the better. I love that idea. Is there any space going to come available in town and country as it tries to come back? Um, I'm not sure what's going on with town and country. I I know that there's been some new paint. The Donald Wexler part of the building has had some work done on it, Mm -hmm. or that sort of courtyard. For Modernism Week, there was a Herman Miller pop-up. Oh, nice. So I'm not really sure what the timeline is on that. I guess I don't know that it would make much sense for us to do a pop-up there since our store is right down the street, but architectural locations are always preferred over something boring. Right, exactly. (laughs) The town and country um, shopping center had had been abandoned for many decades, and preservationists here are, are working to bring it back and working with the owner to try to figure out some strategies to uh, initially just make it look better and get some people in there, get some activity going, try to find ways to uh, preserve that beautiful piece of mid-century retail. Right. By Paul R. Williams. By Paul R. Williams. Trina, thanks so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for having me, George. That's George's conversation with the incomparable Trina Turk, poolside, at the Hotel Skylark in Palm Springs. Thanks for listening. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Diane Bald and the Budman Family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. And by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. Want to go with us to Modernism Week in February 2023 and stay with us at the U.S. Modernist Compound? Email george at usmodernist.org. Okay, Tom, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 15,000 significant modernist houses, and access 4 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist Carrie Cesarino did some heavy lifting this Modernism Week, researching dozens of guests and making me and George sound thoughtful, clever, and well-informed, even when we were distracted. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. 
I'm Tom Guild. George and I'll be back to Palm Springs this next February and we'll do it all over again. Until then, stay tuned next week for more true stories of modernism and the men and women who love it, all right here on U.S. Modernist Radio. Modernist Radio.